for a long time there has been a line drawn between human beings and every other species on the planet. Um, we've always believed that we are, we are special and um, we can use to our advantage in any way we like any, any other non-human species. Um, the problem comes with, with where do you then draw the line? At the moment we have this really, when you think about it, quite absurd dichotomy between human beings who are persons and everything else, uh, all other animals, all other sentient beings, um, including the great apes, that are just things really at law. They can be owned, they can be disposed of, they're just property. So when people ask where I draw the line, I say, I, I'm not even really sure where I draw the line. I don't really spend too much time thinking about where I draw the line. What I, what I think in terms of is, is where would judges today draw the line using the principles and values that they use day in and day out. I don't see this as a legal right. I, I mean, you, if there were enough people who, who, who accepted it as a moral matter that we ought not to treat animals as commodities, then you could use the law to, to protect that moral right. But it's basically a pre-legal uh, moral right not to be treated as property. That is the only right that I believe we ought to accord to animals. But if we did accord them that one right, our whole basis for institutionalized exploitation would evaporate. Well, it depends on how seriously you take this. It means that you can't kill a stray dog or a stray cat. If it means that a wolf gets out of, a, out of some kind of a zoo, it's allowed to roam the city streets because it's got personhood rights, or, or you're allowed to act in self-defense against these people, or only but not to use deadly force. I don't know what the rules are gonna be. For me, any being who can feel anything, can have any experiences, or as we might say, any sentient being, has interests, um, has an interest in not feeling pain, for example. And therefore, that interest ought to get considered and be given equal weight with the similar interests of other beings. But I also think it's possible to draw other lines within that sphere and to say, for example, that it's worse to kill a being who has self-awareness and is able to think about its own future than to kill a being which has no such awareness. There is one movement for giving personhood to great apes. Now, I, don't, I find that difficult to understand because I understand personhood to be something that can only be intrinsic to humans, so I can't imagine as a, a great ape as a, a human in any way. So I, I have difficulty in my own mind because of what personhood actually means in my mind, and it's totally restricted the definition is totally restricted to humans. Any animal who is conscious of experiencing life, so I look at consciousness as the criterion for where I draw the line. Generally, the way people look at this is if the animal can get away, if there's some sort of painful stimulus, for example, and you see the animal swim away, run away, fly away, then that animal knows uh, you know, I'm conscious of my own being, I need to get away. I personally don't support uh, upgrading the class or which great apes come into. Um, <clears throat> I think they are definitely special animals, but uh, non-human animals nonetheless, and as such, shouldn't be afforded the title of person. The first criteria would be that those that are closest to human beings and uh, the great apes are closest to us from an evolutionary point of view and also the fact that they come from the same common origin as we do. I support the idea of, of changing the concept of, of all animals from property to something else. There are many animals right now uh, and wildlife that need much more protection and much more rights under the law um, but I think part of the question is is really what's the most advantageous way to advance the debate and to rally the general public around the notion. Many people argue that, that sentience should be a criterion for rights. And uh, uh, most of them are moral philosophers, or, or some, some of them are lawyers. Um, you know, I, I've, as I said in Drawing the Lawn, you know, if I were the Chief Justice of the Universe, I might, I might agree. But the fact is, is that I can't find an argument in, in uh, Western law that supports such a thing. 
And so um, maybe someday that will come to pass. But it seems to me that using the idea that I have now, practical autonomy, makes a lot more sense uh, because um, it's, a being who has practical autonomy is, um, is a very cognitively complex being. A being who has sentience may or may not be a cognitively com complex being. And if I can't win with practical autonomy, then nobody can win on sentience. So for me, the question has to be reframed. It's not which species are worthy of consideration, but what do we need to do to help change or, or remind human beings that as, compa as, as beings capable of compassion, our ethic needs to be extended and broadened. I think that focusing on what I call the similar minds theory, I mean, I, I have a name for this, the similar minds theory, the idea that the animals that matter are the ones that have minds similar to ours, I think is dangerous. What it does is it reinforces that hierarchy. You got the line. You got the line between persons and things. And animals are over on this side because they're property, they're things, they're things that have no moral value, they only have extrinsic or, con or conditional value. And so what we're doing is we're not erasing the line between persons and non-human things. We're just taking a small number, a very, very, very small number of non-human things and we're saying let's put them over on this side, but let's keep that line very, very, very sharply focused, and the answer is no. I think the problem is the line. The old Jeremy Bentham question is, can they suffer? And that is what a lot of people in the movement are asking. Are they sentient? Do they feel pain? What can we do to reduce the pain? Well, you know, the meat industry would like to reduce the pain right out of those animals if it could. So that's not really asking the question about survival. Uh, and about thriving on their own terms. By drawing the line, I'm reinforcing a time and its hierarchy. Uh, I, am, I am a lawyer, I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not out to create a whole new um, philosophical or, or, or um, legal regime. Uh, I'm, I, I want to operate within the legal system. The legal system that we have now is thoroughgoingly speciesist. So I can either make a thoroughgoingly speciesist argument or I can lose. And so I don't wish to lose. I want to, I want, I, if, if, if what judges accept is a thoroughly going, thoroughgoingly speciesist argument and I can convince the judges that they need to be, to be able to, to begin extending the law past humans, to be able to bring in chimpanzees at the time and the, law is drawn, the line is drawn there. And then we have to argue about dolphins, then we argue about parrots, then we argue about elephants, then we argue about you know, any, any other animals. We do it one at a time. That's the way the common law works. And then that's the argument, not only that I, that I make, but I think ought to be made because I think it has overwhelmingly the greatest chance of success. And my attitude is that, that we've been down the slope of exploitation for thousands and thousands of years. Let's try the slope of compassion, of expanding that circle. And chimps, rats, sheep, dog, what about trees? Maybe we could slip down that slippery slope so that the whole planet is respected and cared for rather than exploited 